So thank you so much for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, over the last 20 years, my collaborators and I, we've been working on translating some of the basic ideas, fundamental ideas and concepts from equivariant bifurcation theory, group theory, essentially, into the design, analysis, fabrication of novel technologies. So most of this work has been done in collaboration as, um, with uh, colleagues from the Space and Naval Warfare Laboratory, now it's called NIWIC. Um, so the overview, I'll, today one of the technologies that I'm going to describe to you is precision timing. So the basic idea is to use symmetry to improve the precision timing measurement of devices. So the goal is to be able to achieve uh, com measures that are comparable to atomic clocks. So uh, currently, uh, the last atomic clock was the F, were the F1 and F2 built at NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, and they can achieve precision timings of somewhere in the order of 10 to the minus 19 seconds. That's crazy. So the question is, um, can we achieve the same level or comparable level of precision timing with something that is cheaper and something that is not necessarily connected to GPS? Because most of the um, atomic clocks, the signals come from GPS. So my main collaborator for the last 20 years has been Visarad in Patrick Longini was my first PhD student. And we have collaborated in many different projects with many different people um, all over the world. Um, so I have several students, masters, PhD, and also postdocs, and funding from various agencies. So let me take you briefly through the tour of the work that we've done over the last 20 years. We started in 2000 trying to manipulate using symmetry to manipulate the frequency of oscillation of networks of nonlinear oscillators. 2001, the war in Iraq broke out, and I was invited to participate in developing a novel a new technology of magnetic and electric field sensors and we created the most powerful sensor on the planet of electric field signals. So we can measure up to in the order of one femtotesla with uh, one single sensor. And those sensors were deployed eventually in Iraq for the detection of IEDs. Then we extended the results to networks of gyroscopes where we have to go into Hamiltonian dynamics and study the effects of coupling. So one of the fundamental questions there that we address is, what happens when you couple Hamiltonian systems? Does the network retain the, Hamil retain the Hamiltonian structure of the original system? And the answer is not necessarily always the time. In 2009, we worked on networks of uh, squids, uh, superconducting quantum interference devices to develop new technologies for communication systems. That's the finger of one of my um, last PhD students, Susan Bergen. Uh, that was part of her PhD thesis. In 2012, we uh, published some papers uh, uh, related to this uh, nonlinear channelizer where we can lock into incoming signals. 2014, we worked on uh, networks of uh, energy harvesting. More recently, 2019, 2018, we worked on networks of spintronics, nano oscillators, to generate microwave signals. Um, 2020, we worked on a uh, disorder in uh, systems that have asymmetry. And the topic of today that I chose for today is what we started in just a couple of years ago, precision timing devices. So let me show you the evolution of precision timing devices. So that's the, um, the different technologies. Uh, this is where we were recently, the F1 and F2 atomic clocks that you can measure somewhere in the order of 10 to the minus 19 seconds. 
So why is it important to measure time so accurately? Well, the reason is that timing is used for communication systems, financial systems. There is many applications. So this is what they do at the National Observatory to measure time. So they take um, an assemble of measurements coming from the atomic clocks, and then they average them out. So they take the timing from you know, many of those atomic clocks, and what they notice is that as the number of atomic clocks increases, the error decreases with a scaling of 1 over the square root of n. So the challenge for us was, well, can we get something in the, in the order of 1 over the square root of n, or can we do better than that? So the first thing, based on all the works, the previous experience, was to create networks of these um, nonlinear oscillators that mimic the oscillations of the atomic clock. And we took different patterns. And what we observed was that no matter how we couple them, we obtain a power law of 1 over n. So most of you are physicists. The physics is intriguing. The engineering is challenging. The mathematics is just beautiful. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about. So we, we discussed many different uh, examples of collected behavior. Can you guess which pattern of collected behavior in a network is the one that produces the 1 over the n scaling law? Anyone? What would be your first guess? If you couple them, which pattern collectively improves precision timing? What does the physics tell you? Or your intuition? So how about synchronization? Raise your hands if you think this synchronization is the pattern. Yeah, that's your intuition. That's what I thought also as a mathematician. Well, we just synchronize them, and the collected behavior of the synchronous state will actually reduce the phase drift. Well, that's wrong. It is not synchronization. And the reason is because if you synchronize them, the network just basically behaves as a one single atomic clock. And it goes back to 1 over the square root of n. So which pattern is the one that produces the 1 over the n, square, uh, one over the n uh, scaling law are traveling waves. So in mathematics, we always ask the fundamental question, why? And how can we prove that this is the fundamental limit? So those are the two key questions that I'll ask you, that I'll try to uh, answer for you. And the analysis that we're going to do using basically group theoretical analysis is for networks of any size and any symmetry, as long as the symmetry is described by a compact Lie group, basically um, uh, closed matrices. So we decided to use the crystal oscillators. I was told by the engineers at Spayward that crystal oscillators have a very large Q factor, meaning that the oscillations don't decay, and that they're relatively inexpensive, or that the decay rate of the oscillations is very slow. Um, so, but the key idea here is that the actual engineering, and to some extent the physics, is going to become at some point less important because the issues that I'll describe to you that basically govern the network are model independent. So model independent means that you can replace these oscillators with crystal oscillators, Van der Poel, Colpitz oscillators, Dauphin oscillators, and the result is exactly the same. Those are universal features that are governed by the symmetry of the system. They transcend the actual physics and the engineering that is behind. But let's, let me walk you through the, we need to choose something. In fact, we don't. The equations won't even matter. But let me just show you what happens when we use crystal oscillators. 
So we get these um, equations that are basically untractable. Each crystal behaves like an RLC circuit. It has two modes of oscillation. The primary mode, I1, is the current, and the second mode is the spurious mode due to material imperfections and noise in the system. So if we want to study just a network of three oscillators, it becomes challenging. Using the, the standard techniques of the isotypic decomposition of the phase space to compute eigenvalues, eigenvectors, it becomes on, you know, impossible. We tried to do it in, in MATLAB and Maple. We couldn't do it. So we needed to uh, apply other tools. So, and that's just unidirectional coupling. By directional coupling, it's also very complicated. And I just like to emphasize that the main nonlinearity is this cubic term in here in the current that co comes from the fact that there is a, a nonlinear resistor in the circuit that governs the crystal oscillator. So let me show you what um, the engineers at Spade or did. Well, they created the network. Uh, this is the one example uh, with three oscillators. And over here is the exponent of the scaling law. So when the coupling strength is relatively small, um, basically the system behaves as a, the network as a one single oscillator, one single atomic clock. So the scaling law is negative 0.5, one over the square root of, a, of, of n. As the coupling strength increases, the scaling law starts to decrease the exponent, and this is what we get in the experiment. Very close to negative one, and lambda equals one is just the normalized point that leads to the um, Hoff bifurcations for the traveling wave patterns. So that's sort of proof of concept. And w we obtain this diagram with pretty much any type of oscillator. So isotypic decomposition is out of the window. It's not possible to do an analysis via the standard techniques. So some people have started nonlinear oscillators using averaging. But what does averaging of a network mean? And my um, friend and colleague, we both were working with uh, Professor Marty Golubisky back in Houston when we met. And we were looking at the bibliography and there was no references for what it means to average a network. So before we do the analysis, we need to understand what averaging of a network actually means. So let's look at just the standard averaging technique. The, averaging, the standard averaging technique is to replace the dynamics of this standard system with the average of the, uh, the main vector field. So when we have oscillations, the averaging basically molds out the fast oscillations, and we just get the slow scale um, behavior. So, but what happens when we have a network? So here's the network, and if we average it, what, what is that going to do? So it took us a, about two years to figure that out, and it turns out that averaging the network introduces an additional symmetry, O2. And this result is generic for any type of network. Gamma is the uh, symmetry, the group of symmetries of the network. In this case, we have n nodes coupled by directional. So that means that we have dihedral symmetry generated by uh, cyclic rotations, 2 pi divided by n, and by reflections. But the averaging technique introduces an additional mode of oscillation, O2. That means that in the crystal oscillator, where we have the, each crystal has two modes of oscillation, there will be gamma cross O2 cross O2. Now the good news is that once that we reduce the equations of the crystal oscillator down to the normal forms, that's the objective. We're going to have gamma cross O2 cross O2, but because it's a, a direct product, the modes separate. So that's the beauty of the mathematics. 
that we can just separate one mode, the spurious mode, forget about what happens there, and we just focus on the main oscillations. Not only we focus there, but we can also predict how the network will behave for any n. You can put n equals 3, n equals 20, n equals 1,000 oscillator. The analysis is completely independent. You can put even n equals infinity. As n goes to infinity, the dihedral group asymptotically converges to the group O2 of rotations and reflections on the plane. And when we have O2 symmetry, equivariant bifurcation theory tells us that there are only two possible modes of oscillations, rotating waves and uh, back and forth um, 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 reflectional waves or standing waves. So we can actually um, you know, convert this to um, a matrix notation. So let's, I'll walk you through the analysis. I'll convince you, the goal is to convince you that um, the averaging technique adds an additional O2 symmetry. And that's a generic result that you can take with you and apply it to any other network. So here's the internal dynamics. This is the uh, coupling dynamics coming from the K plus one oscillator. And this last term contains all the nonlinear terms. So then we apply, we go into a co-rotating frame of reference using Van der Poel, the Van der Poel transformation, a standard Van der Poel. And so now we get the amplitude and phase dynamics. They have not decoupled yet. So the amplitude dynamics depends, this is just notation, depends on the amplitudes of the oscillator K, K and here I forgot to include the K plus one because it's unidirectional. In the bidirectional coupling case, we will have XK, XK plus one, and XK minus one. But it's the same, the same principle, just like with the phases. So, and then omega one and omega two, we replace them with omega zero. Those are the two fundamental frequencies of the harmonic oscillators, um, the two modes of oscillation. So then, we, um, uh, embed this or put this into a vector notation. So now we have vectors x1 through xn and phases phi1 through phi n. And then we just create uh, n copies of the two basic frequencies of oscillation. And we can write the, the equations, the network equations for unidirectional in this form. So the first result shows that H1 and H2 are gamma equivariant. So what does gamma equivariant or equivariance mean? It means that the equations are symmetric. So what is symmetry? It's the set of transformations that leave an object unchanged. So if I replace X with gamma X, H1 and H2 will commute with the action of the group. On the left-hand side, we'll have gamma, uh, on the, just right behind H1 and H2. And over here, when we replace X with gamma X, we get gamma X derivative, because gamma is just a matrix. And so the equation is gamma equivariant. And that's just this main result. So I'm just going to outline all the basic results, the basic ideas, uh, the details I'll show you to you there in a few uh, publications. Um, so then there is also an even odd symmetry. H1 has even symmetry. H2 has an odd symmetry. That's a classical symmetry that appears in many of the nonlinear oscillators that we, we use. So the first key is um, we, to do the averaging, we, we would like to separate, again, fast and slow variables. We just applied a shift, and when we shift, we can actually separate here. Notice that this derivative is just on the shift dynamics. So now we can focus on these equations. They become ready for the averaging technique. And so then, what, what is the averaging technique? Uh, how is it performed? It's a near identity transformation. And that's what this theorem says, that if we have a, 
So that was one of the first theorems that my friend uh, Luciano Bono and I were able to prove that this is the original dynamics. We had already separated the phase shift. So this system is equivalent to the average system through the near identity transformation. And h bar is basically the integral of h over the phase shift. Remember, there's two main frequencies. So omega 1, omega 2. So that's what we have 1 over 2 pi squared. So that's how we do the average in, on the network. So now we are left with the average network. We went from x, or from i currents, to x and phi to y and beta. So this is the average system. And we notice that the, in the, aver the average system depends on the differences of these phase variables. And there is a natural SO2, just a rotation action induced on beta 1 and beta 2 that acts as a shift on the phase. So there's two, because there are two modes of oscillations for the crystal. If we replace this analysis with cold pits, there will be only one variable. So that means that h bar is SO2, SO2 invariant. We're getting closer. We need to prove reflectional symmetry to then have rotations and reflections. Then we'll have automatically O2 symmetry in the average network. And we do that by, uh, we show in the manuscripts that um, the y variable can be written in terms of uh, Fourier modes, and the Fourier modes have one of them is um, even symmetry, the other one has the odd symmetry. So then from there we show that the reflection symmetry uh, acts on beta goes to negative beta, ellipse y invariant. So that means that H1 bar is Z2 kappa invariant because there's nothing happening. But H2 is Z2 kappa equivariant because it changes beta to negative beta. I know there's a lot of mathematical details that go behind this, um, but this is just the outline of the basic ideas. So one last step is then we complexify. So again, we went from currents to x to y. Now we're going to complexify the equations. Because it's much easier to manipulate the equations in complex notation than in real notation. So when we complexify, Ashwin and Swift have uh, shown that uh, the complexification acts by multipli multiplication by e to the i theta, or whatever the shift is. And the reflectional symmetry acts as conjugate of the z variable. So this action is the one that it adds the reflectional symmetry that we were missing. So now we have the complex version of the average system has two modes, Z1 and Z2. And uh, the modes split. There are two fixed points of spaces that we can analyze independently, where Z1 is 0 or where z2 is equal to 0. So we can split the dynamics completely. And so what is this good for? Well, this, is, this tells us that uh, we can do the analysis of an entire network using the entire theory of equivariant bifurcation by, developed by uh, Golubisky. So, and that's what we show in here, that for instance, we would like to eliminate the second mode because that's the noisy part. We focus on the main oscillations, so we choose z2 equals 0. And we show that in this theorem that if this solution has isotropy subgroup sigma, so the isotropy subgroup of a solution 
measures the amount of symmetry of a solution. So if this solution has this symmetry, which could be whatever of the rotating waves, if we have three oscillators, we have the standard wave, one, two, three, one, two, three. If we have five oscillators, we have the standard traveling wave, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, or we skip one, one, three, five, two, four, one, um, three, five, two, four, and so on. So it's all the combinatorics that are encapsulated by the isotropy subgroup. So um, we show three main results. Kappa acts on, uh, diagonally on Z1, so that means that there is, um, there is absolutely irreducible representations, but there is no pattern formation coming from the kappa action. It only comes from the SO2 action, which introduces the phase shift that is the standard phase shift of the Birkhoff normal forms. And so then we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the solutions of the average network and the solutions of the original system. We cannot just simply go and run simulations for n equals 1,000 and say, oh yeah, what we see with the average corresponds to the original system. So this theorem basically proves that. And this is basically just the formulation that uh, we can use all the standard uh, equivariant bifurcation theory on one variable at a time. So this first part shows you uh, the outline of the proof that an average network with gamma symmetry translates into gamma cross O2. If there are two modes in each oscillator, you'll have gamma cross O2 cross O2, and so on. So then the next question is, why is 1 over n the best we can do? Is that the fundamental limit of precision timing of reduction in the phase drift? So what we did, we took, this is for the unidirectional case, so we took, so here alpha k, this angle, corresponds to phi k minus phi k plus one. Remember that I, what you don't see in here is that the previous analysis allow me to separate amplitude and phase from each mode. So once that I decouple them, I can just focus on the phase dynamics because that's the one that measures the phase drift of the of the network of nonlinear oscillators. So we have the phase dynamics, we introduce noise, and then we do look at the linearization, and we solve, again this is for a unidirectionally coupled network of n nodes, whatever n is. And so we solve for the uh, shift on the phases, and the shift depends on the inverse of this matrix A. This is what the matrix A looks like. Notice from where you are, you could probably see better than me the cyclic nature of the matrix. So this is one, two, two, three, and so on. So for the bidirectional case, we will have also a C component over here and so on. So we'll have the nearest neighbors coupling. Now, once that we have solved for this phase shift, we just uh, compute the power spectral. We go into Fourier analysis. We look at the inner product. And so in this case, for the unidirectionally coupled, the inner product of any two uh, oscillators, uh, it's a function of one over n. These are, whatever these uh, entries are, they're just the entries on that coupling matrix. And the network, the power spectral of the phase drift of the network is just the sum of all of this. 
for every single oscillator. So we just look at the sum and divide by n, and then we take the square root. And so there is an n in here. That's why n times n is n squared. And then when we look at the, the uh, uh, square root, we just get 1 over n. So the phase drift of the network is a scaling factor. All of this is just a number. Scaling factor of 1 over n. So that's why the scaling is exactly 1 over n. And if we do the same calculation, very straightforward calculation with the uncoupled network, we get that the, um, the power spectral is now 1 over n. When the, we look at the square root, we're going to get 1 over the square root of n. And this also explains why traveling waves are the best patterns. Because let me just go back here to the matrix. If we change the coupling scheme from unidirectional to bidirectional, only the entries in this matrix will change. What about if we do all to all? Well, we will populate completely this matrix. And what that does is it only changes these coefficients. But the scaling is still a function of 1 over n. So no matter how you couple them, and here we have to be careful, no matter how we couple them linearly, as long as the coupling is linear, the scaling law is still going to be 1 over n. An open question is, what about nonlinear coupling? Well, you know, which form of nonlinear coupling can we use, right? So that's, that's an open question. So these are three publications. Um, we publish one paper in Cyan where we do the entire classification of the network. Um, then we show the actual phenomenology with the electronics or the circuitry in physical review E. And the last paper that we publish is basically the last result that I show you that shows that the scaling law is precisely 1 over n and that we cannot do anything better than that. That's the fundamental limit. And the results of this work and many other pieces of work were published on the first book with my colleague, Visa Rav. And this is just another book that I just uh, finished last year in case that you're interested. So there's um, about 15 patents that we uh, produce through different applications. And if you go to the United States uh, patent uh, websites, you'll find some of those patents. So I hope I have shared my enthusiasm for mathematics, um, because it is indeed is the language that allows us to write how these systems uh, behave. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah.